I, I came back from a trip to Europe in our hiatus, and I met a Rob in New York, and he basically knew where he wanted to get to at the, in, in the end of the season. I mean, getting there, of course, obviously is, is, is challenging, but he really had a vision that would pop up throughout the series, which we were going to end up with at Ides of March, which was you know, Zena and Gabrielle both being crucified. And what did it mean? And tantalized the audience with it. And it was brilliant. I mean, that's, Rob is wonderful that way, that how he can come up with those things to interest and entice the audience. I'm so happy to see you. I heard you were teaching in Greece. I set out to find you. As we went through it, as we explored more and more Gabrielle's journey, it became apparent that also what needed to be resolved in the Ides of March was Gabrielle's philosophical story. I made you leave the way of love. That was my fault. I had a choice. The decision to do the Caesar aspect of it uh, and have uh, Zena be responsible, really, in a way, of, in a wonderfully manipulative way of, of uh, uh, for, for Caesar's death. You were the Ides of March, Brutus. Why the Ides of March? Because on that day, Caesar will declare himself emperor. Was, of course, taken directly from the Xena Scrolls, where once again, her place in history has been obscured by lies. So uh, she was, in fact, uh, responsible for Julius Caesar's assassination. And, we, and we, it was a pleasure to rectify that. Let's make this short and sweet. Brings back memories, doesn't it, Zena? Well, I mean, the naked truth is it's always good to get Callisto in. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. But we did also f f feel, I mean, because Hudson is so charismatic and wonderful, and why not bring a, a really neat, beautiful, sexy actress back to play a wonderful villain? So, I mean, it's, there's a sort of a no-brainer aspect to it. I always liked playing Callisto. I liked playing this role, actually, because when Rob called me up to ask me if um, I'd be willing to do this, I, was like, I said yes, but one condition. I want another outfit. I want to wear something different. Who's suffering now, Callisto? The costume in hell. Well, it was supposed to be nothing. He's like, are you comfortable if we put you in nothing? I mean. We'll, we'll like make the crew very scarce and we'll cover the things that need to be covered, but we want it to look as naked as possible. And the way I am, I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Be naked, I don't care. The bikini from hell. And it wasn't like a horrible bikini, it was just a little, uh, little bits of cloth. I told him your desire. You mean he's gonna let me go back? There was also, I felt, and I know Rob felt, that there was some unresolved issues with uh, Callisto. And that, that haunting issue that had bothered me from day one when I invented Callisto, which was, you know, why does Xena get off so easily? She was a war criminal, and now she's got a hit TV series. <sighs> right, she cooks my family, destroys my life, and I end up in hell while she gets another shot. <laughs> I frequently talk about the tools that the editor has in his little bag of tricks, and the primary one being cutting and pacing, how quickly or how slowly we let something play. I've already indicated many times that if when you want to generate intensity and energy, you cut very, very quickly, and action sequences almost always tend to be cut that way because we want them driving and dynamic. In a situation where Zena and Gabrielle are trying to escape from the jail and battle their way out of the fortress with Eli and his followers. We cut these things very, very quickly. There's action here, there's action there, there's action all over. And then there's a single defining moment in that sequence wherein Callisto, who's up on the ledge watching all of this, who's getting very upset about the fact that Xena may thwart her plans, decides to throw the chakra, which then goes very quickly into the courtyard, hits a, a back wall, comes forward, and hits Xena in the back, thereby breaking it. that moment, 
everything goes to slow motion. So we've taken a very intense sequence and suddenly changed the emotional dynamic. We are no longer working on energy and speed. We are now working on pain, anguish, and fear. And to get those emotions across, we go into slow motion with almost every piece of that sequence. There are even pieces that were shot in slow motion that were slowed down even further in the editing room. But what we do by this is suddenly something that was basically an action-oriented sequence now has an emotional heart, which is quite, quite brutal. And following Xena down to the ground and then see her face shake when she impacts gives that scene total emotional resonance where before it had simply been an action sequence. Why did the shotgun break in two when it hit Xena? Part of that was a, a vision that uh, Rob had about the next season of putting it back together and stuff and having an episode of doing that. Uh, I think, too, though, and, and my rationale of, of writing it was, in a sense, a, you know, Xena and the, and the chakram are sort of one. Uh, spiritually, they were one. And, 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 and when Xena broke, the chakram broke. And uh, I, I guess they're, you know, that's, that's the way I saw it. It's sort of like a, uh, like a broken heart. <laughs> when Gabrielle picks up Xena's sword, that is, of course, the end of her, her, her uh, deliberating on whether violence is an appropriate alternative. She's going to uh, inflict some serious damage on people who were threatening Xena. No! Shut up! I can't, Gabrielle. We'd all fall in love with Gabrielle her doing soft and tender things. And so to see her in such a violent rage was, was exciting. In a weird way, satisfying, too. You know, like, particularly after we did the pacifist thing the whole season. I, was, I mean, I love that. I, that was one of the things, dailies, I was just so excited. You, know, so you, you get, after a certain amount of years, you get a little numb to dailies, but that was an exciting day to <laughs> watch Renee kick butt. <laughs> Does Renee do that great? I mean, that's just great acting. I mean, when she, and you watch her, uh, just this great scene. I mean, and, and it was such a nice completion of what we, we, we were building up for, for the entire season. It's not uncommon for me to refer to how pacing or cutting uh, affects the drama or excitement of a scene. If you want to build excitement, if you want to build energy, you tend to make your cuts very, very quickly. You'll cut from one inch to the next very, very fast and make those time beats very quick. If you want to generate emotion, if you want to accentuate drama, then I believe you have to slow those pieces down. You have to, rather than have little tiny pieces, you'll, you'll draw them out and give them excess emphasis by the fact that you're lingering longer on a particular moment. Uh, there's a scene in Ides that I found particularly moving uh, at the time I was editing it and with subsequent viewings as well because I did that very same thing. I let those emotional moments play very long. And the scene I'm referring to is where uh, Zena and Gabrielle are in the jail awaiting their fate after Zena's back has been broken. And if you notice, the opening shot of that scene is on Zena's face, and she's obviously in a lot of pain, and she's obviously suffering, and she doesn't quite know where she is yet until she moves her eyes and eventually sees Gabrielle. And it's a particularly poignant moment in the sense that we stay on the, on the actor for so long, we get her pain, we get her misery. And we do that by staying on her and reading the emotion in her face. Now, thank God Lucy Lawless brought a great performance to that moment, which allows us to see that. But it's by staying on her and letting us see it that helps the moment gather impact. 
Then we cut back to Gabrielle, and the scene plays out between the two of them. But if you contrast the action sequence that preceded that, which is the big fight in the, uh, in the courtyard, it's plainly obvious to see how the editing rhythms change our response to the performance and how we interpret the emotions. I'm sorry for all the times I didn't treat you right. When I wrote the prison scene, I, I had a, a feeling, or I, I had the desire to want these two characters who had, had been together and said kind of loyal, friendly things to each other for four years just to pour their guts out. Before I met you, no one saw me for who I was. I felt invisible. But you saw all the things that I could be. And really just tell each other how much they loved each other. Right? There was, it was sort of a, a, uh, a consummation of, 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 of so much. And, and, uh, and, you know, the actors did it great, and I was so pleased with that. That was a, that was a terrific moment in the series. And I'm so happy to, uh, that uh, so many people like that. That's one of the episodes that I like and the audience likes, and that's, that's a wonderful uh, matchup. Standing out in the snow, I think I was looking up um, while we were just on hold and setting up, and I was looking at all the snow, and I think the director came up to me and said, stick your tongue out. And I loved that. I thought it was brilliant. He goes, catch the snowflakes on your tongue. Because it's so like Callisto. I mean, and everybody knows what that's like, being a little kid and having that little kid side of you. And that's what's so grotesque, is that you see this little bit of innocence from someone that's helping crucify other human beings. I mean, it's just, the, it's so twisted. Are you ready for your trip to Gaul? I'll be ready. Good. I believe that Ides of March was perhaps one of the most powerful Xena episodes we ever did. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think one of them hap would happen to be uh, a very, very important sequence in the show, that being Xena and Gabrielle's crucifixion and Caesar's assassination. Those, that, that's the culminating point at which the sequence ends. But prior to that, we keep cross-cutting back and forth, back and forth, showing these two parallel events. People who understand history know that Caesar is going to be assassinated in, in, the, in the Roman court. And I must supply the leadership so desperately needed. The cutting between the, the crucifixion and Caesar's assassination was Rob's vision I don't think it's, it was from day one. I think he, he, he evolved that. But uh, you know, he, you know, what he had from day one is the crucifixion. And then he, he started working on, I want an intercut with uh, the assassination of uh, Caesar. So it was always Rob's uh, idea. And uh, uh, you know, I wrote it pretty much as he saw it, which is the intercut. So you know, it turned out great. They, they filmed it wonderfully, and they cut it great. <laughs> This day, the 15th of March, I declare myself. If you watch very carefully in that sequence, you will notice that when Caesar gets stabbed, Xena reacts. And when the hammer hits the nail, Caesar reacts. And so it's all even more cross-cut in that Xena and Caesar's lives are so inextricably inextricably tied together, that they're almost experiencing each other's pain, which I think brings an overall emotional impact to what essentially is a brutal and gory murder. Uh, I, I just was so impressed with how, what they did with it. I mean, it was just great television and uh, like I was really, in my writing, I was really into where the two characters were, Zena and Gabrielle. But I wasn't really thinking of the, what it would look like that much, you know. I mean, sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. 
And when I saw it, I was just so impressed with it. It was just really one of the great moments of the series.